However, such extremely damaging statements are the exception. Generally, unless there is a specific, constructive reason to pass on negative comments, you should not do so. All Jewish ethics generally forbid lying. You are permitted to be less than fully truthful when asked, what did so and so say about me? The reply is likely to inspire ill will. You are permitted to fend off the question with a half-truth, omitting the negative comments the original speaker. The Talmud itself states even God is shading truth in this way. And three angels visit the 99-year-old patriarch Abraham and predict that within a year his 89-year-old wife Sarah will give birth. The Bible records that Sarah, who is listening nearby, laughed to herself, saying, Nigh that I am withered, am I to have enjoyment, with my husband so old. In the next verse, God says to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I in truth bear a child, old as am I? God omits Sarah's reference to Abraham being told to impregnate her, apparently fearing that Abraham will become incensed at his wife. From this incident, the rabbis conclude that when human feelings are at stake, it is permissible to relate less than the whole truth to deviate from the truth. In the words of the Talmud, even if doing so conveys a false impression, rumors. The Washington Post reporter Bob Woodward, along with Carl Bernstein, authored one of the great journalistic coups of the past century, the story of the Watergate cover-up. In the decades since, Woodward has been regarded as the most prominent investigative journalist in the United States. One would therefore expect such a professional to be acutely aware of the importance of always carefully checking sources for legal, not to mention ethical, reasons. But during the media uproar some years ago that greeted Senator John Tower's nomination as Secretary of Defense, Woodward, operating under a severe deadline for the post, reported a retired Air Force sergeant's claim that he had witnessed Tower when he was publicly drunk and fondling two women at an army base. They'd according to Woodward's article, the man had witnessed Tower touching one woman's breasts and patting the other's buttocks. The article went on to quote the sergeant as saying that if one of his daughters had been the victim of such lewd conduct, he would have been sent to Leavenworth, implication being that he would have assaulted Tower and been willing to go to prison as a result. The Air Force sergeant was the only named witness in the article. Woodward referred to other informed sources who allegedly also were aware of the event, but he never specified who they were. Unsurprisingly, his article led many readers to conclude that Senator Tower was both morally and emotionally unfit to be a cabinet member. Within a day of his article being published, it became known that Woodward's eyewitness had earlier been dismissed from the Air Force because of mixed personality disorders with antisocial, hysterical features. In other words, Woodward's source was a severely disturbed individual who, it appears, had made up the story. Confronted with this evidence, Woodward responded, you report what you can get, he added, and I wish I had had more time on that story to check. But ethics dictate that you don't report what you can get. You only report stories that you have overwhelming reason to believe are true. To the Washington Post's credit, as Professor Larry Sabato has noted, the paper subsequently published a correction with a comparable front-page placement. The Talmud teaches, if something is as clear as the fact that your sister is forbidden to you as a sexual mate, only then say it. In other words, before banding about words that can destroy another person's reputation, be as careful as if you were holding a loaded gun. This should be obvious, but many people deem it morally acceptable to report rumors, even though, from the perspective of the person damaged by a false story, the effect can be devastating. I do not want to suggest that Woodward normally did so he didn't. This is particularly unfortunate, since so many rumors are both negative and, not infrequently, false. After all, when was the last time you heard something like, hey, did you hear that so-and-so is really a wonderful person? Casually spreading rumors is yet another violation of the golden rule, and we are the subject of an unpleasant rumor. We desperately do whatever we can to quash it. Yet when someone else is the rumor's subject, many of us spread it, oblivious to the pain we are causing its victim, and not even knowing for a fact whether it is true. Ask most people whether they ever spread malicious lies about others, and they'll respond, no, certain that they would never do such a thing. But if you spread a negative rumor that turns out to be untrue, that is exactly what you have done. Believing that your words might have been true affords little consolation to the person whose reputation you have damaged. Few people, after all, who get drunk and then drive do so with the intention of injuring or killing someone. But if you drink and drive, there is a good chance that you will eventually kill or hurt someone. If you pass on nasty rumors about others, sooner or later and like someone, 
if you pass on nasty rumors about others sooner or later and likely sooner some of these rumors will turn out to be false and you will be guilty of spreading a malicious possibly reputation destroying lie about someone. Some years ago, I was conducting an ethics advice column for BeliefNet. A man a woman forwarded to me an email she had received, claiming that the clothing manufacturer Tommy Hilfiger had been a guest on Oprah Winfrey's television program, and that Oprah asked him if he had said the following. If I had known that African Americans, Hispanics and Asians would buy my clothes, I would not have made them so nice. I wish those people would not buy my clothes, they were made for upper class white. According to the email, Hilfiger had answered yes, whereupon Oprah asked him to leave the show. The email then urged all readers to give Hilfiger what he wanted and not buy any of his products. The woman who forwarded me the email, a good friend, then added as postscript, as a person devoted to influencing people to act more morally, I thought you'd want to post this email and encourage others to act like my friend and me and start boycotting Tommy Hilfiger. Of course, it turned out that Hilfiger had never said such a thing. Even before I checked into the rumor, I was quite certain it was untrue, for I was unable to imagine that a businessman like Hilfiger, even if he were a bigot, would say things on television that would cause large numbers of people to boycott his business. Businessmen want to increase the number of people who buy their products, not alienate them. I wrote back to my friend, suggesting that she verify the rumor, as I had done. She did so, and quickly learned that it was a malicious falsehood. Hilfiger and his company, which featured models of all ethnic backgrounds in its advertising, were horrified that this rumor was circulating on the internet. Tommy Hilfiger no bigot, and he hated being thought of as one. I therefore suggested that, as a first step, she contact everyone to whom she had sent the email she sent me and tell them that she had made an error. I also suggested to her, as I do to all people who hear nasty rumors about someone, that she check out any subsequent rumors she hears very carefully before passing them on. As is so often the case in life, we should apply the golden rule. If somebody heard such a rumor about you, how carefully would you want that person to check it out before sharing it? And if he passed it on without checking it out, and it was also untrue, how impressed would you be by his defense that he thought it was true? As a general rule, and unless there is an ethically compelling reason to pass on rumor see the following section, the best response to a rumor is to follow the rumor see the following section, the best response to a rumor is to follow the advice of the apocryphal book of Ecclesiasticus. Have you heard something? Let it die with you, be strong, it will not burst you 1910, is this advice easy to follow? No. We all like to be thought of as being in the know and having access to information that others have not yet heard. But if the information you spread is nobody's business, that is morally wrong. And if it's both untrue and negative, that's worse than wrong. It might well be unforgivable certainly so if you don't try to undo the damage. When you can't confirm the truth of a rumor, but feel ethically obligated to share it in some instances, it is morally permissible to pass on a rumor privately for example, when a physician is rumored to be practicing treatments that are harmful to patients, or a financial advisor is rumored to have lost a great deal of his client's money. It is still forbidden, however, to present as definite something you don't know to be a fact. When you disclose facts that are only hearsay, the damage you inflict may be devastating and irrevocable. Therefore, even where another's safety or well-being mandates that you report a rumor, you must make clear that it is a rumor and requires further investigation. You should say, I don't know this to be definitely true, but I've heard that so-and-so has made some very risky investments for his clients and lost considerable amounts of money. I think you should check further into the matter before you invest money with him. I know that just saying that can be very damaging to the object of the rumor, but saying nothing could be very damaging to the potential investor. I suppose the expression, being caught between a rock and a hard place, applies to situations like this. That is why, until I feel confident in my facts, I would speak only to people who might be interacting with the person in question, and I would emphasize that I don't know the rumor about that person to be factually true. Slander. The most grievous violation of ethical speech is the spreading of malicious falsehoods, what Jewish law calls Matso Shamra, giving another a bad name. Consider the following story, which appeared in USA Today. A nine-year-old girl falsely accused a substitute teacher of sexual abuse and bribed ten other kids to do the same, police said Tuesday. The teacher whose name I'm omitting, although it appeared in the article, 43, was cleared when police uncovered the plot. The man, who had been a substitute for about four weeks apparently had difficulty with the class his first day at Fuller Elementary School and sent some students to the office. 
the child offered nine girls and a boy dollar one each to report that the teacher fondled them. The Cook County State's attorney got the complaint May 9. Investigators interviewed 14 children the next day, and by the end of the day we knew that every allegation was false, says spokesman Andy Knott. The teacher calls the incident a nightmare. A lot of people were willing to crucify me. Twelve An especially troubling aspect of this story is that none of the ten children to whom the child offered a bribe seems to have refused it or to have reported her. They all seemed oblivious to the damage they would do to their victim. Yet to destroy somebody's good name is to commit a kind of murder. In English, as noted, the same ideas conveyed through the expression character assassination. But of course it is not only children who pass on cruel, even vile, stories intended to hurt others. There is no shortage of adults who do so as well, though unlike the children in the USA Today story, they don't generally claim that they were the personal victims. And the ability to cause great damage to others has only been magnified in today's age of the internet. You can spread a damaging untruth on the internet and reach tens of thousands, even millions of people in matter of minutes. Even when you spread a rumor among fewer people, your victims can suffer enormous emotional damage, such was the case with John Sagenthaler SR, a lifelong journalist and free speech and civil rights activist. Sagenthaler had served in the early 1960s in Attorney General Robert Kennedy's office and was sufficiently close to Kennedy that he was one of the pallbearers at his funeral. Most people, as Daniel Solov notes in his book The Future of Reputation, gossip, rumor, and privacy on the internet would be flattered to have an entry about themselves in Wikipedia. But Sagenthaler was shocked to find that his Wikipedia bio contained the following unmitigated lie. John Sagenthaler SR was the assistant to Attorney General Robert Kennedy in the early 1960s sick. For a brief time, he was thought to have been directly involved in the Kennedy assassinations of both John and his brother, Bobby. Nothing was ever proven. Sagenthaler wrote about the horror of his experience in USA Today, a horror that was magnified when he learned that the same scurrilous text was found in reference.com and answers.com. When Sagenthaler learned that Belsoft Internet was the service provider for the person who had written this Wikipedia entry, he contacted the company for the person who had written this Wikipedia entry, contact the company to request assistance in correcting the matter. Belsoth informed him that it knew the person's name, but would not reveal it unless ordered to do so by a court. Betting a court order would, of course, involve an expensive lawsuit, and Sagenthaler, though very upset, didn't pursue the matter. I have consistently found Wikipedia to generally be very reliable and have used it often in my research, but it is also true that the authors of its articles are unknown and very difficult for the average reader to trace. More than four months after the article had been posted, Wikipedia finally removed the defamatory accusation, and another person, outraged by the horrible injustice to Sagenthaler, was finally able to trace the AP address of the writer. It turned out that the man had posted the article as a prank to rile a co-worker, and he apologized to Sagenthaler. Sagenthaler, himself familiar from childhood with the story that opens this book about the repentant slanderer who was told to cut up a feather pillow, scattered the feathers to the winds, and then retrieved them commented bitterly, that's how it is when you spread mean things about people. Slander can never be fully undone. There might well be some people who to this day think that Sagenthaler was somehow implicated in the Kennedy assassination. In the age of the internet and its accompanying anonymity, the potential to be made shem ra and disseminate lies about people is greater than it has ever been. Spreading lies about both individuals and groups of people has a long and horrible history. The most famous biblical example of mass slander with potentially genocidal results is provided in the book of Esther Hammon, advisor to the Persian king Ahasuerus, maliciously lies by telling the king that the Jews refused to obey his laws. Like many liars, Hammon is persuasive, and Ahasuerus soon empowers him to murder every Jew living in Persia and its 127 provinces. Fortunately, Hammon's lies are disproved and his murderous campaign thwarted. Too often, however, the victims of slanderous tongues are not saved. In the 14th century, during Europe's devastating Black Plague, antisemites and others seeking scapegoats spread the claim that Jews had caused the plague by poisoning Europe's wells. Within a few months, enraged mobs had murdered thousands of Jews. In the 19th and 20th centuries, similar sorts of rumor-mongering bigots provoked the lynching murders of many African Americans in the South. Literature is very familiar with the theme of individuals who spread malicious lies. Thus, in Shakespeare's 38 plays, 
there is no villain more vile than Othello's ego, whose evil is perpetrated almost exclusively through words. At the play's beginning, Igo vows to destroy the Moorish general Othello for bypassing him for promotion. Knowing Othello's jealous nature, Igo convinces him that his new wife, Distamona, is having an affair with another man. The charge seems preposterous, but Igo repeats the accusation again and again and arranges the circumstantial evidence necessary to destroy Distamona's credibility. Soon Othello comes to believe Igo. In the end he murders his beloved, only to learn almost immediately that Igo's words were false. Othello, hell, as has long been noted, is truth seen too late. A similarly destructive tongue is possessed by Mary Tilford, the twelve-year-old protagonist of Lillian Hellman's classic play The Children's. Precocious but vicious child, Mary is disciplined by one of her school's headmistresses. Fearful that some of her other misdeeds will soon be uncovered, she confides a scandalous truth to Mrs. Tilford, her grandmother. The school's two headmistresses are lesbian lovers. Within, the grandmother has alerted everyone to this fact, and alarmed parents withdraw their children from the school. Weeks later, the rumor is finally proven false, but by then the school has been shut down, one headmistress has committed suicide, and the other has broken off her engagement, certain that her fiancé does not fully believe that the rumor is true. The grandmother feels deep remorse over what has happened. A normally moral person, she knows that she made insufficient efforts to establish the story's veracity before destroying the lives of two women. At the play's end, she appears at the surviving headmistress's house, willing to do anything to make amends. Of course, there is nothing she can do other than express some ineffective words of contritio. Nobody ever gossips about other people's secret virtues, the British philosopher Bertrand Russell once noted. What is most interesting to many of us about other people are their character flaws and private scandals. Therefore, before you spread information or views that will lower the regard in which another is held, ask yourself three questions. Is it true? Even if true, is it fair? Is it necessary? Chapter 3 The Lore of Gossip In the future, all the world's animals will come together and confront the snake. They will say to him, The lion stalks and then eats its prey, the wolf rips apart another animal and eats it. But you, what is the pleasure you derive in poisoning and killing a human being? The snake will answer. And what is the pleasure human beings derive in spreading malicious gossip which humiliates and sometimes destroys others? Babylonian Talmud, Tehrani 8a. As a rule, the rationale for wrongful acts is self-interest. Embezzlers wish to make quick money, guilty defendants manufacture alibis to avoid being punished, and thieves break into a house because they desire another's possession. But what do gossips gain by hurting other people's reputations some 1,500 years after the Talmud set down the parable that opens this chapter? William Shakespeare conveyed a similar bewilderment about slanderers' intentions and actions. Who steals my purse steals trash, but he that filches from me my good name robs me of that which not enriches him, and makes me poor indeed. Shakespeare's assertion seems inarguable. A person deprived of his good name by a slanderer is surely impoverished, while the slanderer seems to have gained no benefit. Or has he? In truth, the benefits derived from spreading malicious gossip may be intangible, but they are no less real. Two, the most important reason we gossip is to raise our status through lowering the status of others. There's a tremendous psychological gratification in seeing someone else's social status decline. Few of us are willing to acknowledge that our motivation in gossiping is so self-serving. Rather, we would have others believe, and perhaps believe, selves that we are talebearers only because the intimate details of other people's lives are inherently so interesting. If that is so, why, then, do we almost always restrict gossip to our social equals or superiors? People rarely talk about the intimate details of the lives of their cleaning woman or gardener. The only gossip that makes us feel better about selves is precisely that which lowers the public esteem of those with whom we are in status competition, our social peers or superiors. I remember first having this thought some 25 years ago, while witnessing the extraordinary public fascination with the unhappy marriage of England's Prince Charles and Princess Diana. At one point in 1992, three of the 15 books on the New York Times bestseller list were detailed accounts of Charles and Diana's clearly unhappy marriage. At one level, this fascination reflected a certain cruel pleasure in seeing members of the British royal family brought down a peg. 
Beneath the tisks was gratification in learning that a royal heir apparent and his beautiful wife apparently were leading painful and unhappy lives. Three learning endless details about the misery of the rich and famous seems to make many people feel better about their own lives. Many of us also derive great enjoyment from seeing a comedown for those who summon us to a morally upright life. Thus, a clergyman caught or rumored to have been involved in a scandal, particularly a sexual one, finds himself the subject of particularly nasty and unrelenting gossip. Such tale-bearing relieves a strong moral pressure on us, for if the individual making moral demands of us can be shown not to abide by such demands him or herself, their downfall seems to free us from moral responsibility. In their path-breaking Harvard Law Review article on the right to privacy, Samuel Warren and future Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandes noted the enticing element in nasty gossip. It appeals to that weak side of human nature, which is never wholly cast down by the misfortunes and frailties of our neighbors. The word weak could as easily have been replaced by malicious. We might well have other, more elevated personality traits, but our motives for exchanging tidbits about other people's miseries are rarely noble. Another way we seek to elevate selves is by retailing inside information about others so that we'll be perceived as being in the know. As Dr. Samuel Johnson observed two centuries ago, the vanity of being trusted with a secret is generally one of the chief motives to disclose it. Does Dr. Johnson's dictum seem overstated? If you think so, then consider the following, admittedly unlikely, scenario. The President of the United States chooses you as his confidant. He speaks with you regularly, sometimes several times a day, shares his innermost thoughts, bounces ideas off you, and otherwise solicits your advice. The only condition attached to your relationship is that you are forbidden to tell anyone, ever, about it. The President also will never mention to anyone, either during his time in office or afterward, that he knows you or has ever spoken to you. For most of us, I suspect, the satisfaction and pleasure of having such access to the president would largely evaporate if we could tell no one about it, neither now nor in the future. A primary motive for gossiping is that, in bragging to others about our acquaintance with important people and important things, we're implying that we must also be important. This motive for gossip is already apparent in children and adolescents, and you just don't understand. Women and men in conversation, Deborah Tannen cites the conclusion of anthropological and sociological research that teenage girls are more likely to betray friends' secrets than boys. Among adolescent boys, Tannen explains, status tends to be based on athletic accomplishments or, perhaps more important, on the ability to prevail in a physical or verbal fight. Among girls, status is linked more to being connected to the in-crowd. Girls get status by being friends with high-status girls, the cheerleaders, the pretty ones, the ones who are popular with boys. If being friends with those of high status is a way to get status for yourself, how are you to prove to others that a popular girl is your friend? One way is to show that you know her secrets, because it is in the context of friendship that secrets are revealed. Thus, a girl who is insecure about her attractiveness or popularity proves that she rates high status through the very action that indicates that she is an unworthy friend. The issue, of course, goes far beyond teenagers and the betrayal of secrets. It seems to be universally accepted that we will be regarded as important people if we know interesting gossip with which others are unfamiliar. In his book Chutzpah, Alan Dershowitz tells a story that reveals a fairly typical kind of gossip monger. My mother is vacationing at a Jewish hotel in the Catskill Mountains and is sitting around with a group of older women. One of them hears my mother's name and, without realizing that she is my mother, launches into a discussion of that other Dershowitz, the Harvard professor. Such a wonderful boy he is, but why did he have to go off and marry that non-Jewish woman? All the smart and successful ones doy, Henry Kissinger, Ted Capel. Why? My mother, playing dumb, strings along the know-it-all. How do you know that Dershowitz married a non-Jew? Mrs. Know-it-all knows. My son's cousin is his best friend. He was at the church where he had the wedding. My mother responds, Well, I heard that he married a Jewish woman, so you heard wrong. Mrs. Kaye assures my mother. 
That's the story his family is putting out, can you blame them? At this point, my mother can't hold back. Alan Dershowitz is my son. I was at the synagogue where he married Carolyn Cohen, whose father's name is Mordechai, and whose mother speaks fluent Yiddish. So what do you say about that? Oh, I'm so glad it wasn't true, Mrs. Kaye says in obvious relief, but quickly adding, how about Henry Kissinger? Is his wife Jewish too? Silly as this case sounds, can you imagine inventing a story that a cousin of yours attended a church wedding that never happened? It illustrates what Jack Levin and Arnold Arluk, sociology professors at Boston's Northeastern University, accidentally discovered in a study of gossip. That inventiveness, untruthfulness is all too common. Frothier experiment, Levin and Arluk, seeking to see how quickly gossip spread among students, had hundreds of flyers printed announcing a wedding ceremony to be performed in front of the Northeastern Student Union building. The flyer read, you are cordially invited to attend the wedding of Robert Goldberg and Mary and O'Brien on June 6 at 3.30 in the afternoon. They circulated the flyers throughout the campus, tacking them on bulletin boards, stacking them in classrooms, and so on. Robert Goldberg and Mary and O'Brien were fictitious figures, and Levin and Arluk distributed the flyers on June 7, the day after the wedding supposedly occurred. A week later, when they polled students to learn how many had heard about the wedding, they discovered that 52% had. More amazingly, they note, 12% told us they had actually attended it. These students said they were there on June 6. Many of them described the white wedding gown worn by Hebridean Theblak limo that drove the newlyweds to their honeymoon destination. The students' responses seemed so bizarre that the two sociologists checked to see if a campus wedding might have occurred on or about the same time, but none had. In their quest to be perceived as people who had the inside scoop about the big event, percent of the students polled were willing to tell a flat-out lie. The desire to seem important can impel otherwise rational people to act in a pathetically dishonest way. How ultimately meaningless such artificial elevation of one's status is, how much more satisfying it is when others raise their opinion of us because of our accomplishments. A third reason we often speak ill of others and this might be the most important one is to exact revenge against people who have wronged us but who we are too timid to confront. This timidity is at the core of much gossip. It might well be natural to have this impulse, for if we complain to the offending party, we risk being hurt again by his or her response. We can easily find consolation, as well as justification for our anger, when others share our feelings about the offense and the offender. This form of gossip usually is particularly unfair. Because we want others to share our anger, we often fail to describe very precisely the offense committed against. If we did, our complaints might not strike other people as so terrible. They might even think that we are at least partially responsible for the dispute. So exaggerate. We describe the other person as having said more insulting things than they actually did, or as having acted toward us with far greater insensitivity or contempt than was the case. Most of us are masters at attributing horrendous motives to people who have hurt us. Our exaggerations, of which we ourselves might not be fully aware, are aimed at provoking others to validate and share outrage. How productive is this quick fix? While almost all fates seem unavoidable when they happen, many turn out to be quite absurd or petty shortly thereafter. If we have made our anger known to many people, we might later find ourselves too embarrassed to make peace with our adversary, whom we have labeled thoroughly despicable. Alternatively, others may reach that conclusion to our chagrin. As I once heard a young woman explain, when I have a fight with my boyfriend, I never complain about him to my parents, because even if I forgive him, my mother never will. All these are good reasons to be discreet when angry. Furthermore, once an adversary hears what we are saying about him, he may become even more hostile than before. He may not only resist making peace, but also start spreading his account of the dispute, in which we will undoubtedly emerge as considerably less heroic and victimized. Thus, a dispute can initiate a whole cycle of injury. My advice, particularly if the matter is trivial, is to keep your anger to yourself. Left alone, it may soon dissipate.
Better yet, confront the person who hurt you. Before doing so, it might be wise to hold back for a few days, containing your angry response while you try to see the matter in a broader perspective, assuming that your adversary is not a terrible individual she likely is not if you have been on friendly terms until now, you could tell her. You hurt me by saying or doing this. Or, I think it was unfair of you too. This might actually lead to an apology and a reconciliation. Ironically, sometimes we don't confront someone with whom we are angry because we don't wish to hear an explanation for her behavior, lest it deprive us of the self-righteous pleasure of our rage. Of course, it's not always possible to confront the person who has angered you. If you confront an unfair boss, for example, you might risk losing your job. With a family member or in-law, a confrontation might provoke an escalation of tensions or even an irrevocable break. In such cases, it may be helpful to vent your anger to someone else, provided that you choose a confidant who will calm rather than incite you. On the importance of feeling free to say whatever you're feeling to a therapist. Most of the time, however, gossiping merely intensifies the dispute and lessens the chances of reconciliation. That is why, when you are the listener, you should try to be a calming influence rather than fan the flames of the offended one's anger. Making a conscious effort to speak ethically can help us become more emotionally direct and responsible and less likely to relate petty arguments to large numbers of people. We will learn, rather, to directly confront those whom we feel have mistreated us. Instead of being hapless victims, we come to view ourselves as capable of defending our own interests. This is no small advantage to be gained from undertaking to speak ethically. If you are going to gossip anyway, two guidelines, the preceding section describes just a few of the reasons we speak ill of others. Here we begin by noting that certainly not all gossip is motivated by the wish to do harm. Human behavior is fascinating, and generally anything that intrigues us is something we desire to share with others. Even the Talmud, the source of most of Judaism's laws of ethical speech, acknowledges that the large majority of people violate these laws at least once a day. What, then, should you do if it is difficult, perhaps impossible, always to refrain from speaking negative truths about others? I suggest first that you severely limit the number of people with whom you gossip and severely limit the amount of time you spend in such talk. If you or your partner learn something unusual, possibly negative, about a mutual friend, you will probably relate it to each other, and perhaps to one or two close friends. But be careful to stop there. This is not an ideal solution, since your close friends may also share the information with close friends of theirs. My friend Dennis Prager, the essayist and talk show host, argues that forbidding people to transmit any and all negative information or opinions about forbidding people to transmit any and all negative information or opinions about others are not only unrealistic, but possibly also undesirable. Dennis once asked me, within the context of a conversation we were having about the troubled marriage of a mutual friend, how can you say you care about someone and never talk about them? Furthermore, he argued, if you never speak about people with your partner, you're probably not very intimate with each other. I know a woman whose husband almost never spoke about other people other. She finally said to him, with some exasperation, so what are we supposed to speak about all the time the dangers of nuclear reactors and the latest actions of the mayor? People who are close generally talk to each other about the people in their lives. Therefore, here's a suggestion. If you're going to gossip with a small number of people, develop a way of talking about others that is as kind and fair as you would want others to be when saying things about you that, though true, are not complimentary. 